great to be here with you all today. Uh, sorry for the technology. Technology is always awkward. I'm going to be doing a quick presentation on bioremediation, just an overview, and then uh, the other speakers are going to take it a bit farther and into kind of more of the local context. Um, so just to get started, give me one second. So just to define what is bioremediation, what are we talking about? For me, it's allying and working with living organisms and systems to detoxify, repair, regenerate contaminated soil and water. And this is done by either binding, extracting, or breaking down different contaminants. So if we're dealing with heavy metals, we're trying to bind them and um, get them out of the environment if we can. If we're dealing with chemicals, we're trying to extract them or break them down. Now, in biomediation, we have kind of a multi-kingdom, multi-trophic approach where we work with uh, kind of three main categories of, of organisms. The first, we call it microbial remediation, and that is working with microorganisms, so things like bacteria. The second is phytoremediation, and that's working with plants. And the third is mycoremediation, and that's working with fungi. And I'll kind of do a quick into each one just to get us started. Now, why are we talking about bioremediation right now? We're talking about it because there's contamination, um, and in particular, kind of post-wildfire. It's kind of the context that I think um, might be on a lot of people's minds right now. But bioremediation is done for a variety of different things, whether it's oil spills or people are worried about heavy metals, whether they want to farm or garden, um, or in the aftermath of disasters like wildfires. Anywhere where there's kind of an event that releases things like heavy metals um, and chemicals into the environment, there's the opportunity to work with these different organisms to help kind of mitigate that impact and get rid of that contamination. In the context of wildfire, we're kind of focused on what's in the ash and the debris. And the ash and the debris, because of kind of how fire interacts with structures and cars and things like that, we end up in the aftermath of most wildfires with debris and ash that have very high levels of heavy metals, everything from zinc, lead, arsenic, chromium, cadmium, um, to different chemicals. Uh, that are things like dioxins and furans, which are carcinogenic, um, cancer-causing chemicals that happen when things like plastic melt, uh, things like uh, PAHs, different kind of hydrocarbon, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon chemicals, things like PCBs, all of that could be in the ash. And when there are things like rain events, um, any kind of like wind storms, flooding, that can mean that the contaminants that were in kind of one place, like in, in kind of ash and debris, can move into other lands and into water. And there's ways to work with bioremediation to try to interrupt that and not only kind of keep that from happening uh, in terms of the impacts, but also, you know, when there's like kind of the removal of ash and, and things like that, how do we kind of heal the soil and kind of decrease whatever's left uh, to make it a healthy place once again? So moving into microbial remediation, what is it? Um, this is where we're working with beneficial microorganisms, different kinds of bacteria and fungi that have the ability to do a whole host of things. They can break down hydrocarbons. They can break down chemicals. Um, they're quite good at that. There's been quite a bit of research that has been done on that and kind of in the field. Um, you also can have microorganisms that are able to temporarily immobilize heavy metals and make them less available to get into water and into to kind of plants. Um, we also really do a lot with microbial remediation to build up clean, healthy soil again. So when you've had something like a major fire or contamination event, you lose a lot of the beneficial biology that's in the soil that makes it so that everything's alive and all the beautiful things can grow. And so there's a lot of work that has to happen in the aftermath to kind of bring that biology back. Um, we also use it to kind of also prepare sites to do work with plants. Um, the pictures here, uh, the picture on the right is an example. A friend of mine does oil spill work where he uses bacteria to break down uh, oil in the aftermath of different spills. And that picture, you can see there's kind of a pile of oil contaminated soil. And when applied with different kind of liquid uh, inoculums, kind of like an actively aerated compost tea that has different bacteria in it that are good at breaking down hydrocarbons, by doing that and also doing a really uh, kind of special composting process, he was able to break down pretty much 98% of that oil in 42 days. Like that's, that's pretty good. So you gotta be specific and, and there's things you gotta do, but there's good potential there. One of the interesting things with kind of breaking down oil is a specific bacteria that's good at doing that. It's called Pseudomonas florensis is actually found in the gut of earthworms. 
So if you do any kind of worm composting or vermicomposting and you get that really beautiful kind of black gold, um, that helps with breaking down oil. If you can take that and put it into your compost and compost tea, it's really good at uh, helping kind of get that started. Um, another example of really good microbial remediation uh, is, you know, things like effective microorganisms and uh, EM mud balls or in Hawaii, I know you guys have, have done this, these Genki balls where you can kind of work with certain kinds of bacteria, put them into water where there's, you know, lots of sludge and kind of too much nutrients. And there's certain bacteria that will really help break that down. And there's been some really great work in Hawaii with like the Alawai Canal um, and working with that. Now, I want to do a quick kind of other piece. We talk about microbial remediation. Um, biochar is kind of in it, not in it. Biochar is when you have uh, kind of biological kind of materials that you combust under really low oxygen conditions. And it creates this really uh, kind of dense and porous carbon material. And you can kind of put that into the earth to either kind of help kind of suck up heavy metals or you can use it as a filter. And it can also be kind of used to bring biology into an environment and really help kind of bring all this beneficial bacteria, kind of give them a habitat. But in particular, if there's heavy metals kind of either maybe coming off in runoff from a burn site or in the soil in the aftermath, using biochar is a really helpful tool to help, again, immobilize those heavy metals, keep them from going into plants, keep them from moving into water, and, and kind of find a way to make it a bit safer as a situation. Now, moving into phytoremediation, that is where we work with plants um, to do a variety of things in terms of healing the land. Uh, there's one element with plants where we use them to hyperaccumulate, which is extract heavy metals. And not all plants are good at this, but there are some that are really good at pulling up different heavy metals, kind of like the solar-powered vacuum cleaner for the soil. And they can do that in both soil and water. Um, and there are other types of plants like grasses, cover crops, anything that's a nitrogen fixer or a legume and trees that are good at breaking down chemicals because they work with bacteria to kind of do that and create good habitat for it. And so just a few examples actually in Hawaii of plants that are good when it comes to breaking down different chemicals. Um, the koa tree uh, was found to be helpful in certain studies at breaking down different insecticides as well as um, PAHs, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Nalpaca and Portia were also found to be really good at breaking down diesel and hydrocarbons as well. Um, some of the cover crops like pigeon pea uh, and, and buckwheat can also be used to break down different kind of hydrocarbons and, and things in the soil. So when it comes to chemicals, there's some good things there. A few other uh, plants that I have on the slide, vetiver grass, which is not native to Hawaii, but I think it grows in Hawaii. Um, is good at pulling up a lot of heavy metals. So it's a good hyperaccumulator for that. Uh, and then the yellow plant at the bottom is called brown mustard. And that's actually one of the phytoremediation superstars when it comes to accumulating lead and cadmium and, and all these nasty uh, metals that we don't really want in the soil. And then uh, certain ferns, like the ladder break fern, is good at pulling up arsenic. So there's a lot of different research, a lot of different plants out there. When we're doing phytoremediation, we always want to start as much as we can with native plants. We never want to use invasive. So we're looking at native plants or plants that are kind of, we know that they can work, but they don't over kind of take anything. Um, and when you have any kind of heavy metal being accumulated, then you have to actually dispose of that plant as kind of toxic waste. But the difference is instead of disposing of huge amounts of soil, and kind of digging and dumping, which is conventional remediation and tons and tons and sending that to a landfill, you're actually just kind of planting these plants that are sucking up heavy metals and disposing of a way smaller volume, right? And so that has its benefits. Um, and when we're doing the chemical breakdown, we're not actually worried about disposing plants, which is different in that capacity. Now moving on to microremediation, this is where we work with fungi to do a whole host of things. So Different mushrooms have different kind of abilities to break down uh, different chemicals. Uh, there's a certain class of mushrooms called saprophytes, and they are the fungi that have evolved to break down kind of things in the forest, like woody debris, lignin, cellulose. And because of, they have that ability using enzymes to break down these pretty, uh, you know, complex chemical kind of chains, they can apply that to different contaminants as well and break them down into less harmful or benign uh, compounds. And so you can see on the list here, these are just names of different fungi, um, turkey tail, oyster mushrooms, things like that, where they can break down different hydrocarbons, things like dioxin, wood preservatives like creosote. 
um, pesticides, insecticides. Some of them can also uptake heavy metals, um, but it's better to focus with fungi more on kind of the chemical piece. And there's examples of folks kind of taking things like, again, oil contaminated, diesel contaminated soil, inoculating it with fungi, and then having that fungi actually break down the hydrocarbons um, pretty significantly over, you know, a period of like six to eight weeks. So good, good potential there for that. Um, and some of these, mushrooms, they might not be, again, in Hawaii, but there's relatives of them that are in Hawaii. So you see the different oyster mushrooms that are listed there. There's an abalone oyster in Hawaii that could be used in a very similar way in terms of having some capacity to break down different chemicals. One of the great things about mushrooms is that they also, their body, the mycelium, create this incredibly tight weave um, that makes a really good filter. So again, when you're looking at kind of runoff that might be coming off a contaminated site, you're trying to keep that contaminated runoff from getting into your water and into kind of other parts of the land, working with fungi and microremediation to make almost something called microfilters to intercept that contamination, it kind of goes through that weave and not only acts as a bit as a physical filter, but also has the ability to neutralize uh, different chemicals. So lots of good potential there. Now, Maya Elson was supposed to give this presentation. She can't make it today, um, but she works for an organization called Co-Renewal, and they're a great organization out of California. There's been a bunch of fires that have happened in California over the last uh, five, six years where different communities have mounted kind of bioremediation responses in the aftermath because they were worried about the contamination from that ash getting into the water, um, impacting fish and things like that. Um, and in 2020, there was a bunch of fires around Santa Cruz where Maya lives. Uh, and the impact of those fires and the kind of toxic ash that was left behind prompted folks in the community to say, what are we going to do to keep that from getting into the water and impacting fish? And, and also, how are we going to clean it up? You know, And they did a bunch of different things. But one of the things they did was this idea of kind of making these micro filters, these micro socks, which are basically kind of burlap, uh, kind of long sock like things that they kind of filled with different uh, kind of substrate and mycelium and they inoculated it so it became this fungi filter uh, and you can see in that picture there they're kind of putting in it's the the beige the beige sock they're putting in a micro sock um, and what they're hoping is that when there is a rain event that ash that has contamination will have to pass through that um, and get some filtration before it carries on to the rest of the land they did this in a bunch of different sites, um, and there was some really great mobilizing in terms of community trainings and community action days and work parties, where not only did uh, kind of co-renewal put out their kind of micro socks um, inoculated with a, a kind of local oyster mushroom, but other folks in the community kind of volunteered and came out and did other solutions. So you can see that green sock over there is actually a compost sock, where it's like another layer of kind of potential filtration and bringing that by and the microbes to help with different chemicals as well. So there was a lot of experimentation that is happening. They're one of the first projects to do this in a way where they're testing and trying to see what the results are so that they could apply the lessons learned to kind of different different fires in the future. But um, it's a really neat effort and, and a lot of hope that came from that. In 2018, there was a similar thing, uh, a similar effort uh, where there was another fire in California. It was the Camp Fire, and it was the deadliest fire in California in Paradise, the name of the town. And a farmer, who's a mushroom farmer in that area named Cheetah Chetty, he actually ended up wanting to do a similar thing because he had the skills to work with mushrooms and micromediation. And he also installed these kind of straw micro socks um, inoculated with fungi to act as these filters from kind of the toxic contamination. And he was working specifically with his neighbors um, FEMA kind of in that situation, FEMA wasn't doing debris removal if folks had kind of trailers or kind of cars that burned. They were only doing it for bigger, bigger homes, I guess. And so there was this need to kind of for the folks who didn't have that extra cleanup to do some of that work. Um, and Cheetah actually did find some good results in terms of decreasing dioxin as well as kind of uptaking certain heavy metals. So that if you ever want to look it up, his his thing is called butte remediation and some neat stuff coming out of that. In both of those cases, there's still a lot of learning and research and, and folks just trying to do it. But it's one of those pretty rapid response things you can do before the rains come to kind of intercept any kind of contaminants coming off a burn site. So I'll just wrap up um, and just a, a few final words. Uh, with bioremediation, so it differs a bit from certain forms of conventional remediation, which is that 
kind of dig and dump. The idea of going in and taking out all the contaminants, moving it to a landfill. Um, often with bioremediation, we're trying to treat things in place as much as possible. Or there's a complementary way where if that kind of landfilling is going to happen because you have so much of kind of contaminated materials, there's still a need before that happens to potentially intercept some of the contaminants. So if it's taking a while to get ash and debris away from a place and the rains are coming, there are tools and techniques to kind of try to mitigate some of that damage and intercept contaminants, like we talked about with either biochar or with the, the microsox. Um, and then there's also the idea of even when conventional cleanup happens, there's still things that are left behind. The standards in terms of what's safe for heavy metals and what's safe for chemicals might not be always the highest. And so if folks are worried about their food and their medicine, there's still an ability to kind of go in after and work with different plants and microbes and, and fungi to kind of do that healing work. Um, the thing is, it can be cheaper to do bioremediation than it is to do conventional remediation, but it takes longer. We're working with living beings and they have their own schedule and it can kind of take multiple seasons, right? So that's sometimes a bit of the, the trade-off for folks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's used in a variety of scenarios. So folks have used it on oil spills. It's used to intercept agricultural runoff so that you don't have all these nutrients going into rivers and lakes and kind of creating these big algal blooms. It's been attempted in post-wildfire cleanups. And it's used in even like more simple situations like community gardens where folks are trying to decrease lead levels using things like phytoremediation and plants. Um, there's a lot of different tools in it. And it's very much kind of a multi-tropic approach for both remediation and regeneration. So that's it for me. Um, and I think we'll go on to the other two presenters. Thank you uh, very much um, for that, that great overview of bioremediation. If I may summarize, they can eat things up <laughs> so they can break down chemicals and, and other toxins. They can take things up so they can suck up those chemicals or heavy metals or toxins and store them in themselves. Or they can um, change the way they, they move in the system so they can lock things up in terms of binding them to soil or other components. And so that's my layman's uh, <laughs> summary of kind of the three major pathways, right, that these bioremediation processes can, can affect um, these toxins in our uh, environment. And um, so with that, we'll go on to Hannah with our next uh, presentation. I think we're going to kind of continue um, on the overview and again, make sure we're all on the same, uh, same footing as we have this conversation. And uh, Hannah will a little bit more delve into the uh, water component um, as we already heard about the, the Aina component. Right, that was a lot. Uh, bioremediation is incredibly complex and at the same time, nature's been doing it since time immemorial, so, and these things can coexist, right? So I wanna begin by saying, doing bioremediation or biorestoration here across Pai Aino Ohova'i has to be rooted in Ea. It has to be rooted in sovereignty. Um, as my partner says, she always says, following the colonial breadcrumbs is really when you'll get to the source of a lot of the contamination that we're facing. So holding that true, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the bioremediation of Vi and particularly one contaminant that's of concern across Pai Aina that is really near and dear to my heart. You did get just a breakdown, but really quickly. Um, so bioremediation, right, the allying with different forms of life, whether that be microbes, plants, or fungi, which is my specialty. And then within that realm, there's myco-remediation. Anytime you see that word myco, we're just talking about a fungus or fungi, many of them. And then within that realm, there's mycofiltration. And so that's working with different forms of life or with fungus in particular, fungi, to remediate vi from a variety of pollutants. And so that's really what I'm gonna be focusing on today. I'm just gonna say it, you guys, I have a passion for poop. And it's really, I say this all the time, people sometimes get a little squirmy in their seats and whatnot, but it's really important to talk about because this really is a source of fertility that then turns into an unnecessary contaminant. Um, and yeah, it's really, really pervasive across Pai Aina. And so this is really what I wanna focus on. This is what I worked a lot with before moving to Hawaii. To break down what is wastewater? 
And if we had a little bit more time, I would even get into the framing of calling something waste and we treat it as such, right? But for today, I am gonna use the term wastewater. So wastewater, according to VI, Wastewater Alternative and Innovations, that nonprofit is broken down into three categories. The first is gray water. So this is anything that comes from your kitchen sink, from laundry, from a shower, and it's really not that contaminated. Black water, which is anything that goes down the toilet and is a little bit more gnarly to deal with. And then storm water. And so this one is really runoff from rain or snow, and that VI really does have the potential to carry pollutants vast distances. And in our current wastewater treatment systems, we really take all of this VI, no matter how polluted or contaminated it is, and we put it into one system. And so that's also a little bit, a little bit of a critique that I have. And what's probably even more, more important is getting down to the components, right? Lila mentioned, I don't know if you got to hear, but we can't really remediate if we don't know what we're working with. So it's really, really critical to know these components. So there's organic materials, food scraps, things that are biodegradable, poop. Um, inorganic materials, these are gonna be nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, cleaning chemicals, pharmaceuticals is a really big one, and then heavy metals also fall into this category. And also, as Lila mentioned, right, heavy metals are already in their elemental form, so they cannot be broken down anymore, but they can be concentrated and dispersed and kind of change how they move through the system by binding to different things. And then we have sus suspended solids. And so if you ever hear somebody say they're measuring for turbidity, um, that's really how cloudy the water is. So how those different soil particles, whether they're sand, silt, or clay, are clouding the water, and that really impacts water quality because it doesn't let light in, and it does all sorts of things like that. And then pathogens, and this is a really key component because a lot of the different current bioremediation techniques that we have can you know, address organic materials, inorganic materials, and even the sus suspended solids portion, but the pathogens, the bacteria that are harmful, the viruses and the parasites are somewhat of a gap currently in bioremediation and like constructed wetland systems. So this is a study, this is my first ever microfiltration study. It was led by my research and life partner, Sinai Hartman, while she was getting her master's up at Humboldt State on unceded Weyot land. It's in Arcata, place named Goudini. And so what we did is we worked with the native fungus Strafaria rugoso annulata. The common name is the garden giant. And not only is it important that we worked with this fungus because she's native, but also this type of fungus is what we call bacteriophagus, or those fungi that actually munch on microbes for their food source. And then we also worked with a native hardwood chip with alder wood chips. And so this super fancy microfilter that is made up of ace buckets with holes drilled in them, we inoculate it. It's what you call when you introduce an organism to a space. So those buckets are filled with the wood chips and the mycelium, right, the main body of the fungus of that common garden giant. And then we worked with AMRI, Arcata Marsh Research Institute, and they work very closely with Arcata Wastewater Treatment Facility. We were able to use some of their effluent or the liquid portion of the wastewater, run them through these filters, and after the first pass through, we saw an 80% reduction in E. coli counts. And so this is a small scale and it was a really controlled flow rate, but it shows some serious potential and is honestly on par for a lot of the literature coming out um, in the Western scientific community as far as mycofiltration goes. I did want to touch on Arcata's wastewater treatment facility briefly just because what they do is a combination of constructed wetlands and then naturally occurring wetlands around Humboldt Bay and that's how they deal with a lot of their wastewater. And I, so living in Hilo, right, Hilo wastewater treatment facility has been on the brink of collapse for many, many years and when it does, right, not if, it will release three million gallons of raw sewage a day, less than a mile offshore of Keokaha. And so, and also a lot of Hilo was wetlands. And so I really see this beautiful opportunity for us to both restore the wetlands and upgrade the wastewater treatment facility to a more Aina-based method. So briefly, Arcata Wastewater Treatment 
The wastewater comes in, it gets separated into the solids or the sludge, and that's, those solids are digested and dried and composted and then actually applied to city property, and they're harmless. And then that VI portion, or what's called effluent, is then taken and sent down towards oxidation ponds. These are really just ponds of VI where they're pumping air into them because the first part of breaking down wastewater is done by those aerobic or those oxygen-loving microbes. So they're pumping the water full of oxygen, the microbes are doing the munching, and then it flows into a constructed wetland where it's then introduced to those anaerobic or those microbes that don't necessarily need oxygen to survive, and they do a different process of the remediation, and that effluent is also introduced, right, to other fungi and to plants, right, that phytoremediation, both above and below the water line. So everybody's really working together here. And then from there, the vi then flows out into the naturally occurring wetlands, like you can see in this photo, and then out into Humboldt Bay. And the one portion before we move on, of this system, right, I mentioned that the bacteria is some of the hardest to deal with. So we do have to include a disinfection portion in these systems. The disinfection, usually, the two really common methods are UV, or ultraviolet light, and that takes power, or chlorine. And chlorine can also have a really negative impact on the environment. And so the gap that I see fungi being able to fill are working with those bacterious, bacteriophagous fungi or those microbe-loving fungi to fill the, the need or fill that gap, right, for munching on the bacteria. So instead of adding chlorine, if after or in between those wetlands, right, the constructed and the natural wetland, they ran through a series of microfilters and then were put out into the naturally occurring wetlands, I really think that would be the cherry on top, the like final bit of remediation that doesn't harm Aina and Vi and actually, you know, puts the water back into the cycle better than, better than it came in. So this is really exciting. This is down Pohoa, also on Hawaii Island. It's a fairly new construction, um, Punakai Shopping Center. So this is the biggest scale, I wanna say, that I've seen um, across Pai Aina of bioremediation and constructed wetlands being in practice. So this system is designed to deal with 16,800 gallons of wastewater a day. And before we get too excited, I do want to mention it's also just dealing with the effluent portion, so that liquid portion. So we still have a little bit of waste to go dealing with those solids that can be turned into compost, but it's a really exciting first step. And so the way that this system works is very similarly. The wastewater comes in, it's pumped through a series of aerating tanks, so they're pumping oxygen, getting those aerobic microbes happy, and then through the constructed wetland, and then it goes into what are called leach fields. And so instead of going into a naturally occurring wetland, these leach fields are really just meant to disperse the hopefully mostly, but also somewhat treated wastewater and effluent down so it percolates through the native soil and that filtration does continue once it's you know, being dispersed. This is another, a photo of the constructed wetland. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there's just like heliconias smack dead in the middle and they're not native, not really naturalized either. Um, so what I would really love to see us do is work with a lot of native species. Vetiver grass is commonly worked with in wastewater, and I'm like, peely grass is a relative, right? And so, and if we can't work with native species, naturalized species. And so, what that means is that a species that came here, right, and a lot of time this is not their choice, um, but they don't become invasive, they actually contribute to the health of the ecosystem, and they really do stay in their lane. And as a settler here, as settler Aloha Aina, I really think a lot of other white folks can learn from this lesson of being naturalized to place. Okay, also gonna focus on Hilo a little bit here just because that's where I live. So, but across Paya Aina Ol Hawaii, right, there are 88,000 cesspools that have to be converted and dealt with by 2050. There was legislation passed, Act 125, I believe, by the 2017 legislature that says this has to happen. And currently we are converting a couple hundred a year and we really need to be converting thousands a year to meet this mark. But because of these 88,000 cesspools, there are 53 million gallons of untreated sewage every day going into our waterways, into our groundwater, and then impacting our coastal waters. In Hilo Bay specifically, 
at any point in time, there's about 5.6 million gallons of untreated sewage kind of floating around. And so this is about 0.04% of the bay. To put that in perspective, it's the equivalent of you sitting in a bathtub, using the bathroom, and then kicking it, like just hanging out in it. And so thinking of all of the, not only people in Kanaka that are using these waters, but all of the other beings that don't have a choice, right? They can't get out and run away from the MRSA and the sludge. To bring this to a Maui context specifically, um, there are a lot of different injection wells across Maui, right? Some are privately owned. Um, a lot of them are owned, operated, and maintained by the county of Maui. And the four that I wanted to focus on are in Lahaina, right? And so in addition to the coastal waters off Lahaina dealing with all of the other contaminants, the toxic ash, and everything that comes with post-tragedy of, of a fire event, like Lila touched on, we're also seeing the compounding factors of the wastewater. And this is something that I really think we can deal with, right? These injection wells don't need to happen. They're currently necessary because the way that our wastewater infrastructure is set up here, um, there's constantly overfull, overflow and overfill. And so there are, it is partially treated sewage that's going down these injection wells, which are just essentially, you know, pukas that the county says, um, like the geological formations and the pohaku and the sand down there are doing the rest of the filtration work. And while they are doing some, again, it's not anywhere near the standard that we can really feel good about releasing this wastewater back into the water cycle. And I think there's just some serious application for bioremediation to deal with our wastewater and turn it back into the fertility that she deserves to be. And that's all I have for you today, super brief. Um, I am so excited to hand it over to Alika, who's really gonna touch on soil bioremediation and all of the really, really amazing, like Lahaina specific work that you've been involved with too, so. All right. <clears throat> well, I think um, the preface of trying to understand the, the world of microbes and fungi, uh, this is not a normal world that the normal public usually discuss, but this is my world. Uh, I'm, I'm a practicing natural farmer, and as farmers of food or plants or medicine, uh, yeah, we focus on the end result, which is the fruits of the labor. We focus on the health of the plants. And through observation or kilo, we watch and then we figure what is needed to produce the best results. And as a grower of food, you have three objectives. One is to grow the mostest or produce in abundance. And you're evaluated by volume or abundance per acre. Produce the biggest of the fruits, like five pounds papaya, seven pounds sweet potatoes. That's the goal. And then the last is the most onoest, the most flavorful, the most delicious. These are, as a grower of food and medicine, these are your objectives. However, before we even can get there, we are truly the farmer of the soil. We have to protect the health of the soil. And through the soil, it is, there's a difference between what is dirt and what is soil. Now let's come to today, after August 8th. We have a real problem. We have an area of five square miles that needs bio, soil bioremediation. An area of five square miles that today we would consider a toxic zone with toxic materials. 
there's talks of having to scrape six inches of the topsoil. Yesterday's meeting, we had a discussion that there were copper pipes placed at 18 inches, and the heat of the fire melted these pipes. And so now we have liquefied metals that are sitting at 18 inches. So now we got to go and scrape 18 inches of these five square miles. Yeah, so these are real today problems to try to solve or find a solution for tomorrow's future generations to live on. This is what we're dealing with in our daily discussions. Discussions of what they're going to do when they scrape it, take it, truck it, transport it to behind the old Oluwalu trash dump site, which is just adjacent to a cinder pit. I was just told that the other day. And I went, huh? That cinder pit, without measuring, I think is only 40 feet from the water table, which is right across the street from the ocean. Common sense to me, I'm going, cinder, gravel, very porous. What can happen when you get big rain? Where the thing going to go? Yeah? So these are things I'm running through, and I'm going, oh, I don't know if the decision makers are really thinking this decision out properly. But that's not what I came for. I was asked by families, local families, to help them prepare for the return to their aina so that they can grow food and medicine on their land. And so as a practicing natural farmer, we already do this. We already use microbes, beneficial fungi, to currently right now we've been taking old sugar lands and old pineapple lands and turning them into fertile producing, food producing lands. And so these families, families have asked us to come help them. And then most recently, this bioremediation group asked us to join them in, in coming up with solutions. And our, our approach is first off through the ethos and understanding of aloha aina. We do everything to carry on the practice of aloha aina so that our future generation here have aina to live on, to thrive on. We look back to the past and I say our ancestors brought us here to today. It's our job to carry us forward. I am confident that we have the solution to turn this toxic wasteland into fertile producing soil. In our process of creating healthy soil, we use what is already here. We have indigenous microbes that already exist on our aina. We hike into the upper reaches of our native Hawaiian pristine valleys, ideally, higher than 300 meters, and go and collect microbes out of the forest. You got to stop and think, who fertilizes the forest? But yet, everything thrives in the forest. Akua. Yeah? So we go up there, collect the sacred microbes, and we bring them down to sea level, and we multiply exponentially the microbes. And it is through diversity of microbes, diversity of bacteria, diversity of fungi, that we put it on the aina. And certain one, two, three, or four microbes 
that survived at the higher elevation, you know, sometimes in a mountain it's very cold. So for a microbe to survive that kind of weather, and then we bring them back down to this comfortable 77 degree environment for them, they become like King Kong at a luau. <laughs> so it's no, wor no challenge for them. However, for the microbes to do their thing, they need darkness. And so we need to put a coat of mulch. That's why we are, whenever we create a mulch, keeping in mind beneficial fungi comes from wood, comes from a tree or a branch. So if you have wood chips as the mulch, as a compost source, we incorporate that. Then microbes need to be fed with some type of sugar or a form of sugar. So that's why we com combine it with carbohydrates. If you're in the audience and have good, good friends with any of the breweries, the guys who make beers, I'm asking for their help that we can collect all of their spent grains. That's the source of the carbohydrate that we could need without importing. Yeah? Uh, take the factoring, I don't know, you can do the math. Five square miles. How many acres is that? 640 acres per mile times it by five. How many square feet per acre? You can only imagine. And if we're going to layer it at six inches, you can only imagine the volume that we would have to need to do that with the old method or OG method of creating what we call IMO, indigenous microbial organisms. However, you know, the Kanakas, we sit around and we try to do a think tank how can we address this issue and be realistic and address it? So we believe we have the solution. We can create liquid IMO. We would make the IMO solid, then we would dilute it into a vat, create a liquid format of IMO. Then we would inoculate the mulch. Then we would get a good friend that has a hydro seeder. You know those guys that spray out for seeding onto the golf course? We're going to ask them, we like their help, to inoculate the mulch and spray this coat of mulch. Now we can cover that five square miles. Yeah? And we create the shading over the soil. Because Lahaina, what does Lahaina mean? <laughs> Cruel sun. Yeah? You guys been out in Lahaina? I mean, maybe you can do them up in Kula because Kula is cooler. But Lahaina, we have to be prepared for that environment. And that environment is hot. And as soon as we apply the microbes, the microbes are going to be scurrying, trying to go down deep into the soil to get away from the sunlight and the heat. So we need to keep this, this mulch layer moist and dark for them so that they get enough time with nature and a kua to heal the aina. Nature is time. Yeah? We are confident through the practice of natural farming methods. We mainly focus on growing food, but here in this situation, we're trying to expedite cleaning up the soil first. Um, we're confident that we can do this in three years. That's working with nature. But we need that time. And we need that source, the resource of bringing in. I don't even know if Maui has enough compost already in production or already produced for us. We may have to uh, reach out across to our cousins on the next door islands. And, you know, I know we have different approaches. I mean, uh, yesterday's discussion was biochar. Do we even have that? Um, how much volume was biochar we needed? I think 80 cubic, like 80 cubic yards. 80 cubic yards, a yeah. lot. Yeah, so they mentioned something like 
35,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a lot just to produce one, one 55 gallon <laughs> barrel of biochar, you know. These are thousands and thousands of biochar. But biochar is a very, um, I think strategically it would be beneficial for us to include biochar into our mix. We do that in our production of healthy soil. And, and for us, we don't do no more than 10 to 15% of the soil being mixed in with biochar. Uh, but that's another sourcing. So I think the sourcing we found was biochar is available in Colorado, biochar is available in Texas. Um, and then another, another dilemma is, okay, how are we gonna get them here? If we put them on a container, that's another three weeks, uh, we talking, oh, we gotta put them on a plane. Okay, who get the biggest plane? The government, the Department of Defense, you know. Or I, I kind of brainstormed, I said, oh, the ranchers, because they fly the cattle out. Whatever plane they use, ask them if they can help us bringing in the, the resources that we need. So these are everyday, real life uh, thought processes that we're trying to go through uh, in preparation for the bioremediation of Lahaina. We have two issues going on. Uh, one is the microsox. Uh, with the anticipation of the mixing of mushrooms, mycos in, in the mix to primarily to have soil mitigation because, face it, we know we never even see the rainy season yet. And we know the rainy season going come. And when the rainy season come, where the water going? It's going to work its way towards the ocean. So right now we're asking for, for all the flood maps. Where are the critical points that we got to place these micro socks so that we can at least slow down the entry of these toxic soil materials and hot, as much as possible try our best to prevent any of the toxic material entering the ocean. We know the long-term damage that can create, you know, because there's a lot of families that rely on the ocean, the ocean uh, uh, beaches as a source of food for the limu, for the tropical reef fish. Um, so this is connected to the life of our people. And so there's a aloha aina approach of we got to hurry up and create these socks so they have a, a team that has the capability of making four miles of socks every day and they're pedal to the metal. I'm telling them, hurry up because the rain gonna come. But yet meanwhile, I'm waiting for the decision makers. I don't know who they are in which department or which government, whether it's county, state or federal. All I like know is what the game plan and who has the political will to pull the pin and say, we go. But I am confident that we, right here, we don't need to turn to the mainland. We get the solution, yeah? We just need the resources to fulfill it, fulfill the addressment. The one was a microsox, two was bioremediation of the soil. That's what we're currently working on. I don't know. <laughs> mahalo, mahalo, Nicola. Um, yeah, and I would want to emphasize that, you know, the region needed bioremediation before the fires. You know, when you look at the plantations with a century of introduction of plastic into the soil, of, of early generation pesticides that were based on heavy metal application, of long-lived second generation pesticides that have um, you know, complex uh, molecules that stick around for, for um, you know, a long, long time. Um, 
the Lahaina landscape already needed <laughs> um, a lot of this, and and you know the the the, the tragedy of the fires just um, I think highlights that. Um, the other piece I would love to add before um, we get into questions is our ancestors um, understood and applied a lot of these practices. Um, in some of my reading of the New Pepa, um, we found the farmer discussing his practice. He would take maia, maia stumps, up into the forest, the native forest, and bury them. Leave them there for three months, go back up, dig them up, take them back to his mala, and spread them out around the mala. And the only thing I can come up with, right, you're taking those mai'a to be inoculated by the microbes, you're using them to transport those microbes back to the mala. So these, these practices are ancient, and you know, that's just an example from Hawaii. We could look around the world, you know, and there are hundreds and hundreds of examples, you know, of how the, the Southeast Asians utilized um, constructed wetlands to process their poop that flowed right back into their rice paddies to then to fertilize the next season of, of rice production. Um, all around the world, indigenous peoples have leveraged the power of microbes and, and fungi um, to their benefit in managing their, their natural systems, their production systems, and, and their human waste. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's always these back to the future <laughs> kind things where finally, right, Western science is catching up and understanding the power um, of, of um, microbial technologies and, and working with microbes. Um, so, yeah, so now we're going to go into Q&A and maybe I'll go take turns because I get lots of questions. So I'm going to <laughs> ask some questions, but maybe I do one, audience do one, I do one, and then fair, fair, fair. Um, uh, but I'm going to ask one question because always, you know, there's always, always naysayers, right? Anything you do in the world, you're going to have people um, uh, come up with reasons why you shouldn't. Uh, so, you know, I just want to ask, like, are there potential negative outcomes, right, or, or uh, unintended consequences of bioremediation that, that can occur? And then, I don't know, can Layla hear us? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think she should have the option to weigh in as, as necessary, yeah. Um, of course, I mean, you know, in my mind uh, the other day when I had that meeting and they shared with us that, you know, the intentions, what I visualized, was that they're gonna scrape all this toxic material, load them on these trucks, drive the trucks over to Olowalu, and pretty much dump it into this pit. Well, this pit is a cinder pit, you know? And for me, I'm going like, well, I don't know. You know, maybe they should consider um, layering it with some kind of protection so that no, no toxic waste would seep down through the cinder and be able to touch uh, the high water mark and, and then eventually seep out into the ocean. So that was my concern is um, how big of a pit and what's their protection plan, uh, you know, uh, to mitigate any of the uh, l losing or s have any seepage of toxic material. And so, yeah, so my concern is, yeah, this, this solution may also be creating a future problem. I also think that sometimes, so we're working with life, right? And sometimes they're not hungry, sometimes they don't work, right? And so that's a lot of Western science's critique is they're like, if you don't get it within this margin of error and 98% of the time it's not valid. And I'm like, okay, well if you don't create the environment that the microbes like to thrive in, you can't expect them to clean up your toxins. So that's one aspect. And then also I think sometimes in the Red Hill context, for example. So two bioremediation solutions have been deployed by the Navy. One is monitored natural attenuation, MNA, or natural source zone depletion. And both of those are ways of saying, you know, let's let the microbes in the groundwater and in the soil do their thing and clean it up. 
which can be a very valid way of dealing with things, but not when we're working with the complex refined kerosene of a proprietary type of jet fuel that has antimicrobial components that the Navy won't hand over the recipe for because of national security. So in this case, it's kind of being used as a do-nothing alternative, and that's also, I think, another example of a fault that bioremediation, maybe more so as a concept, um, can use, right? These governments, these agencies, taking it and being like, okay, you want bioremediation, and then not actually doing anything to create those environments conducive for those microbes, for those fungi, and not doing, yeah, not doing enough. Okay, so I was informed for the more tech savvy, uh, if you scan the QR code, you can submit um, questions. Um, and in particular, if we don't get to questions, um, we'll create, because this going, the, the video will be posted, and then we'll also answer questions there as well. Um, so if we don't get to your question, um, and you put them in the QR code, then online somewhere we'll have questions answered. Um, <laughs> but um, we also want to take questions now as well. Does anyone have um, a question for our panelists? Sure. Aloha. Um, mahalo for all of your work. I kind of have two questions. The first is like a simp, I mean like I have no expertise in your world at all, um, but how soon after you put in these microbes is the soil ready to consume? Um, or like if the plant was used, when can you eat that? Is it like two generations from now, three months kind of thing? And then my second one is about what happens to the ocean? And, and are these solutions for protecting the corals and just kind of like hoping it doesn't run off or are there different things for like protecting the, wa the ocean water? Um, uh, to touch on that first one a little bit, right? Like how soon after can you start, you know, growing food again in soils? Um, do you wanna? Yeah. Okay. The answer, kilo. You have to observe, yeah? There is no answer. Nature will tell you the signs that the soil is ready, yeah? There's no, I cannot tell you I'm gonna apply this and in two months ready, go. No, you have to practice observation. You have to master kilo. And use your mind, yeah? Use be creative thinker, be a critical thinker. Akua never give us the answers. He made you earn it. And so um, all I can say is we work, for us, our practice, we work with nature. And with nature, it's a process of time. We work with microbes. We know the environment that the microbes are successful in. And they do their thing in the darkness. So we create that habitat for them to do their thing, yeah? So we might have to put tarps so that it's over the soil and, and they can be working on it 24 seven. If you don't, then you know that certain time of the day it's gonna be sun and, and the microbes will go dive deep and, and not be present. So it's the effort you put in to expedite the healing process. And in, and in addition to Kilo, if you are testing your soil, what we've found is like you can be testing, let's say there was a diesel spill and you're getting lower and lower numbers and then even when you test and there's no more, it's called TPH, total petroleum hydrocarbons, then you need to t test the plant tissue for heavy metals because oftentimes all of these things are combined and that's how they'll manifest in the plant material. And so really making sure even after your soil's tested and is all good, then you're testing those plants first and those tissues to make sure that you're not ingesting the rest of those toxins. Um, I had the privilege of doing some soil testing for a lo'i up in Kohala that had been contaminated with some diesel. And it's been a year and a half and they have just, they've had their first row of kalo. They didn't do 
the first generation they didn't consume, but the second one is safe. So the fact that you put that out there, I was like, oh, actually, the example that I've been a part of is true. But this is a two-year process, and the lo'i wasn't very, wasn't very big, and it was only about 20, 25 gallons of diesel contamination. But that was one example, I guess, of a time scale. Um, and then for the ocean question, I wasn't sure if you were talking more about like if the microbes that we're working with on land can be harmful for the ocean, um, and they cannot survive in that environment. Um, and then the mycosox, right, that's my portion of the group that we're working with, is really meant to address, yeah, provide that barrier so as the vi flows through the, that filter, um, most of those contaminants are either, right, absorbed by the fungi or they're broken down on a molecular level. And I just want to touch on really quick, like, why can fungi do this? It's because a lot of our contamination are or contaminants are petroleum-based. Petroleum-based products come from fossil fuels, which are just ancient plant material that's been sitting underground, compressed and pressurized for a long, long time. And so when the fungi are approached with it, they're like they're cell memory, yeah? Their DNA, they remember that food source, even from ancient, ancient times. So that's why they have that ability to do that. And no, the microbes couldn't survive in the ocean and cause any additional harm to the coral. And I, and I think, you know, like say the microsock approach, um, I, would, I would strategize the placement of maybe even doing three high, uh, knowing that Lahaina side, the sun is very hot and high sun. So you might be sacrificing the upper layer so that the middle layer is more protected and more in the prime environment of shade and darkness and so that those microbes are the ones that's going to be doing the bulk of the work. You know, some of the microbes that might be on a top layer sock, they might be too exposed. And so they're, you know, I don't know, you know, I can only assume they might get fried uh, by high noon, you know. Have you guys been out there? It, it you know, can get hot. Yes, two more mona'o. One is the two species of fungi that we want to work with are Pleurotus cystidiosis, and that is a Pleurotus, those oyster mushrooms that we saw that are well documented for having petroleum remediation capabilities, but we have one here, that's our abalone or maple oyster. They do require a bit more moisture and less sun, so for Lahaina application, we're really excited about looking into bloody polypore. So that fungus that we have here will just grow straight up on like driftwood with high salinity, a lot of salt, in the direct sunlight and still do really good things. And then speaking of like flow rates and doing multiple socks, that's kind of a necessity, right? Because even though we already had this, like Lahaina was a lot of cement and so while, but even the places that were soil or are soil, when a fire comes through, the top layer of soil becomes hydrophobic. It doesn't l allow for the water to come in anymore, so it forms almost a soil crust, making it even more slick and even more of a reason to do multiple layers of socks. So while we're in talks with you know EPA and FEMA and whatnot and just barely pushing for these four miles, it really needs to look like 16, right? So that we can fortify um, and put at least three and then provide those little microhabitats like Uncle was talking about, that are dark and moist on the inside. When you say those fungi are here, are they indigenous fungi to Hawaii, or are they are fungi that have been introduced for cultivation? And so we're not introducing anything new, but we're not necessarily using our indigenous fungi? For our approach, it's already here. We're, we're indigenous, is, we're just going on our land reaching up into the valleys, like say for example, um, we'll, we'll hike into Kaua Ua Valley and, and make collections up there. Uh, we'll go up above Kahoma, make collections up there, and we're just basically bringing, bringing what we find in nature and exponentially multiplying it. And I think I've, so people have, the language of nature, or of, of native and naturalized, right, in the Western scientific community, because, so the two species of fungi that I'm talking about have been here, 
since Western science has been documenting it, but because they haven't done the genetic analysis on them, they refuse to say native, and so they use the word naturalized or local. So that's why the language I use, but just because it hasn't been proven in that context doesn't mean that they're not native, but I just don't wanna give any definitives as far as yes, they're native, and yeah, so I say local or naturalized, but they have been here since for a very, very long time. Okay, this might be a stupid question, but in this five square miles, um, and I'm from Honolulu, so I don't know anything about Maui, but in the duration of this biomediation and all this, what kind of human activity takes place on top of that, that, that part of you know, five square miles, or what is allowable, you know, because I'm just, you know, does it just stay quiet for the time that it needs to regenerate, or do people go there and start farming or putting houses, or you know, just just asking that question, you know, because human beings, being what they are, you know, they want to do something. <laughs> yeah, can, but you know, I think uh, from what I'm hearing, it's going to take a while for people to get there. So. The sooner we can get there, the longer our material can be there while the residents and landowners are working it out before they actually need to be active on their, on their actual property. So, uh, you know, um, for me, it's the sooner we can do our thing, the quicker uh, the residents can be, be there. But it's up to, you know, the decision makers to allow people to get in there. And I really feel this like inherent need right to Malama spaces and also a lot of people like he, being a part of the healing of Aina is healing ourselves and themselves. And you need like a hazard a hazardous waste cert and all and to go through specific trainings and whatnot. Um, and so I think that there is a way and that we can restructure so that when people do want to help, I know that the county did offer some certs for impacted residents, but we, we need to be handing out like entire PPE and getting like a bioremediation cert in addition to a handling toxic waste cert and just have this available, available for people who do want to participate. For example, right, a lot of the Ohana that were really eager to get back to their homes and it was this huge debate and I think my biggest critique about that is because people do really need to heal, but they need to be fully informed about how toxic, and if they do want to return to their hale, like they rightfully should, they need to be handed an entire booklet, or not booklet, but like entire gear of PPE and be completely informed, and then not just necessarily this like political hands off of, it's either all or nothing, right? These binaries that we always see. So I think that there's a way that a lot of people can um, kokua and help with the whole, with the situation that we're dealing with. So I know there's been a lot of talks, sorry, going on, I've been moving around and keeping you on your toes. Um, there's been a lot of talks, right, with EPA, with county officials. Um, you know, I'm just wondering how receptive are they? You know, are these micro socks, like do you have permission already to lay out these micro socks or, um, Anyway, yeah, curious about the receptivity uh, of our government agencies to this. This is all recorded, yes. Um, I think that initially it was kind of like a hard no, right? And even when, so a lot of our group, right, a lot of us are haole, and we are trained in the hard Western sciences, and we really feel like it's our kuleana to do the grant writing and the proposal writing and all of these hundreds of pages of documents that are required to even be considered. Um, I think now they're at a point where this much of a toxic environment has never been this close to the ocean and that the EPA and FEMA are a little bit scared of liability, and so they're kind of at a point where they're ready to hand it off. Even if it's just strictly for liability purposes, I'm like, we know that the fungi and the microbes and the plants will do their thing when called upon, and so we're not afraid of that liability, but I think that's the key to getting them to listen to us, and we just, our group had an interview with FEMA and a meeting with the EPA just last week 
um, finally getting the ball rolling and them finally listening to us and taking the biotechnology seriously. So I think we've made some serious headway and it's been really, really difficult, but this is going to set precedent for fires kind of everywhere and especially across, you know, quote, United States because current protocols are the scraping, are things like pump and dump, are lowering water tables. And so now that they kind of have to listen, also, and just looking, like the Lahui, the way that you guys formed immediately and are pushing for, and like, no, we want to do and we will do bioremediation solutions, I don't think that they really have a choice. <laughs> okay, so the event took place what? August 8th. What's the date today? Yeah. My only experience I have is government move too slow. Yeah. You asked me about if I've communicated with government. My recent communication was November 1st. What is today's date? I never get no response yet. Yeah. So I never get no response yet. So that's my response. Yeah. I've been meeting with groups. We knew... And so we've met from one month after the event, like, hey, we got to address bioremediation. We've huddled up. We've gone statewide. We've had this discussion. We've reached out and offered. They're going to turn to the mainland for the solution. And so today I say, we know what we got to do. We just need the political will to pull the pin and let's go do it, yeah? We need the resources, because this is big volume, big volume of the kinds of IMO we gotta go make, you know? We gotta take nature and exponentially grow it so that we can apply it onto the soil so that the, the microbial organism will do the amending and do the remediating. And then later on, we will put the plant species that will draw out the toxins from the soils. But we got to initiate it by doing this microbial soil approach. But we need the decision makers to make the decision. Um, I don't care, you know. Right. We're going in at night. <laughs> Hi. Um, two questions. Um, just for clarification, I guess. The, the fungi in the micro socks, do they in any way neutralize the toxins or are they just absorbing the toxins and preventing them from going into the water, into the water or when the rains come? And if they don't neutralize it, what happens to those socks? How do you get rid of what's then caught in those socks? So a lot of the organic and even inorganic contaminants can be dealt with because the fungi secrete enzymes. And it's really those enzymes that have the ability to break apart the molecules, those hydrocarbon bonds, which are some of the hardest to break down in nature. So a lot of them are broken down on a molecular level from those enzymes and are no longer toxic. Heavy metals would be our biggest concern as far as the uptake and then having to dispose of them. But the mycosocks aren't necessarily, the intention is not to address the, uh, the heavy metals with the mycosocks. This is why we want to incorporate biochar. So biochar does a really good job. It's incredibly porous, as Maya said. And in those little pores are habitats for the microbes. And so it's the microbes that are able to bind the heavy metals in different ways and make them less bioavailable. So even if they are to continue on, they're bound in a way that renders them inert or they can't be uptaken by, um, by biological life. So it's really the enzymatic production of breaking apart on a molecular level and then the yeah, inertion or the binding of heavy metals to different things. Now, if the mycelium does uptake these heavy metals, right, this is a huge, it's a thing that we are constantly talking about dealing with. Um, 
vermi remediation, working with earthworms. They have incredible gut bacteria that also bind those heavy metals even further. And so we could potentially feed some materials to them. Um, some, there's this thing called uh, myco-mining, not really great uh, using like mining, but you can extract those metals out of the mycelium. Or honestly, it has to go along with the rest of whatever's deemed hazardous waste material and we just kind of coordinate to get it in that cleanup process too. So not really a great way to deal with heavy metals, but they are breaking a lot of those contaminants like PAHs, polycyclomatic aero hydrocarbons, um, VOCs, volatile organic carb carbons, compounds, compounds. All of these acronyms, right? PCBs, um, polychlorinated biphenyls. So those things are really just kind of being broken down and are no longer those things. I guess, and the second question, just following on from what everyone has been sort of talking about, uh, Alika, Alika? Mm -hmm. uh, said something about the scraping and, it, and I think mentioned three years for the microbes to do their thing. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we're talking about um, years and years before we should even consider rebuilding? No. So, it's, so what, what, part of, what part of Lahaina is going to take three years for the microbes to do their work? And how does that work with everyone else who wants to start rebuilding? I'm confident in seeing that through experience of working, uh, for us, we do farming and we do growing of food. And when we go in in a contaminated area and, and just growing through different crops and, and going like say three different rotation of crops, um, applying the IMOs, uh, approach of microbes, if we can create an environment of diverse microbes, just like creating a diversified food forest on the same land, you now bring in diversity of microbes. And I think even when you do spray, let's say, IMOs on cement, they may not live for very long, but they will do the work. And so it will just take more than one or two applications on concrete materials compared to if we're spraying on Aina. And then as far as the building comment, so I think we have no say for what the vision of Lahaina and the restoration of Lahaina looks like. A lot of the Kayaulu um, that I've talked to maybe doesn't necessarily want things built back the way that it was or that it looks. And so that's not really something that I can comment on other than we are going to kako'o uh, the lahui's wishes when it comes to 
what Lahaina is going to look like three years from now. And I don't know if that includes getting in there and building immediately or if it's about us getting in there and malama Lahaina and doing the remediation for three years before um, we even start the conversation of building. So I don't really know what that looks like and it's not necessarily my place to, but. Okay, aloha everyone. Um, I guess I have a couple questions. Um, I know that Uncle Alika and Leila, they brought up about, and everyone on the panel, about microbes um, and using cover crops or native crops in order to suck out some of the toxins out of the ground. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's like a threshold of how much these plants can actually take out. So I was wondering um, what happens to the crops after they have done their job, they've taken out all the toxins that they could, um, what happens to those crops? And then is there a way to use it as a resource later on so that it's a whole system that is renewable? Um, and then I guess because I come from like the pu public policy, um, policy making realm, um, just wondering like what type of workforce futures or development can be made through these, through these practices that can help in terms of like with Native Hawaiian employment and in that realm? I would do different approaches of depending on what the plant species is and, uh, and the de development of the, what is the uptake. Um, part of me would be I would just stack them up and burn them, you know, um, rather than keeping it around or eating it and, and, and ingesting it, uh, whatever, you know. So I would look at other methods of trying to push it on to the cycle. Uh, one method I think is, yeah, it's probably not, you know, the air, the air going to expose it, but um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to expose the children that's walking in the yard. Uh, so these are decisions that you, the practitioner, got to decide on. I, I also uh, have thought about public policy from this situation, you know, and looking at it from the Aloha Aina and looking at our current building materials and then realizing like, brah, there's a lot of asbestos. There was a cycle in our era of construction, homes made out of asbestos. There's a lot of toxic metals that were, are used in our building materials. And then now the other day I'm being told that the, the fire was so strong it melted the copper pipes and I'm going, Okay, so every new building, what is the percentage of toxic building materials that exist in every building? And then I'm going, okay, from the policy side, shouldn't we create an aloha aina tax for every building that, hey, if something happened, we got to go, this is what we're doing today. We're dealing with an accumulation of years of building, and in this situation, we have toxic waste to deal with that have all melted. I mean, now that's our kuleana, yeah? We, we're stuck with that problem. But using hindsight for foresight, how do we prepare for those who choose to build with toxic materials? I also think an alternative to burning would be taking all of that plant material. And so if we were to just go with OG remediation methods, it, we would be scraping up, let's say, an area the size of this stage and putting it in a toxic waste facility or a place. Then if it's bioaccumulated up in plants, uptaken by plants, we're working with half of the stage of material. We take that material, we compost it. Now we're working with one panel. And so that's still might have to go to a hazardous waste facility, but it's a lot less in volume. And even then, there's a lot of different types of compost, right? And so if we're working with thermophilic compost or compost with high heat, there's ways that we can manipulate what's left in that soil. And then if we get down to only, you know, the heavy metal component, heavy metals are not inherently bad, right? Fire is not inherently bad. All of these things naturally occur. Um, it's just about concentration and where they are and how they're bound. And so we can then take, take them, make them 
bound to things so they're not accessible for us to uptake and then spread them out over a wide area for them to then re go back into their metal cycle. And I think that's the approach that I would take. And the policy comment, I would love to see us form like a bioremediation response team the same way that we have, you know, FEMA's response team. But, you know, led by the Lahui, Kanaka led with these coming from Ike Kanaka um, and having that be the first responders to crises like this. Um, I apologize, I have three questions, but they're gonna be short answers. So my first question is um, regarding, you had requested like the breweries and um, their spent grain, just Maui or anywhere in Hawaii? Okay, awesome. And then um, if I can connect with you about getting an email sent, we can get some things started on that. And then um, for the um, hydro cedar, do you have that connection already? No. Okay. But that's and, my dream. Okay. And then my third question was just, what is your group that you keep referencing? What was that? What is the group that you keep referencing? You say our group. Maui Bioremediation Group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the group um, already has um, a processing farm site. Mm -hmm. and, and they have the equipment. Uh, in fact, this morning I got a call from someone saying that um, they heard my request for... Uh, spent grains from the brewery, and I said yes, and they said, okay, where are we going to take them? And I, I t told them the location, and I called the guy, I said, oh, keep the gates open, I think you get a couple of trucks coming, so, you know, yeah. but yeah, we'll receive whatever, and I think, I, I want to put this request, because that would expedite it, because if we have the spent grain and or uh, from the mainland, uh, wheat mill run, which is from uh, the flour mills, when they, they process the, the wheat, they separate uh, the flour and the chaff, the mill run, we just take their opala, we take their waste, which is the mill run, and, and that's our carbohydrate source uh, with our wood compost, and we create uh, the IMO that way. Uh, the most inexpensive and efficient way is what's already here in state. And so we reach out for spent grains from all the breweries. But the volume, when you, you know, just visualize, okay, five square miles, six inches thick, how much volume is that that we need? Um, I don't know, I, th I think I lost track, it was like 5,000 40 foot containers that we would need. Of, of grain. So any, any amount will help uh, because from that we can expand it into the liquid form and we can cover a bigger area. And a quick shout out to Maui Brewing because we're already in, that's the one brewery that we are in contact with and they have offered to supply us with a lot of that grain. So nobody go after them, but go after the rest. Awesome. Um, so I know there were other questions in the audience. I'm sorry, we're, we're winding down and, and I'm going to take the last question. Um, but, you know, um, other than connect you guys to spent grains, uh, what, what can people do? How, how can other people help and contribute and, and, you know, build the inertia and momentum uh, of this effort? Um. You know, earlier I mentioned that I'm a, I'm a state board member of Master Cho's Global Natural Farming of Hawaii Network. Um, we feel that we want to contribute to the education and support to the families. Uh, when, whenever that timeline comes for them to be able to occupy their lands. And so with that, we have scheduled uh, uh, natural farming uh, educational workshop uh, a weekend in April. Um, I think it's like mid-April, around the 19th, whichever is the Friday, Saturday, Sunday in April. I know one of the dates was 1920 or something like that. But here at, at UH College, we'll have uh, training and education, teaching families and individuals of how to make these soil amendments 
and soil solutions, not only to remediate the soil, but it'll help you and encourage you to grow food in your backyard or front yard and uh, just getting people growing more food and medicine that is pure and natural and no involvement of chemicals or synthetic salts. So for Maui, we're doing a class in April. For Oahu on North Shore in Wailua, Haleiwa, it's going to be in President's Day weekend, February. And I think for this project specifically, also just bringing your mana'o, bringing your connections. Um, this is not my mokupuni, and this is also not the worldview that I necessarily come in. So especially those from the ahupua'a of Lahaina, but just people based in Maui and that can give eyes on these documents that we're speaking the language of the government for and that can give their, yeah, honestly, just feedback. And then whenever we put out that kahea for community activities like, you know, making microbial inoculated balls with clay or offering certifications to get your hazardous waste or toxic removal cert, um, yeah, just being open and ready and we will take all of the help that you have to give too. So connect with us. Um, I can put my personal email. The group also has an email, um, info at Maui Biorem dot org com, maybe. Um, but we'll make sure that we, <laughs> we get, I'm also not the you know, logistics person on the back end. And we do have people that write are on the ground in Maui, but not necessarily write from that ahupua'a. So just coming with, with what you have. We all have something to offer, and I think that we will take all the help we can get. And then I'll, I'll extend the invitation to just reach out to me via email. My email is my name, Alika Atai, A-T-A-Y, at Gmail. Awesome. Well, really want to give a, a huge mahalo uh, to you, Uncle Alika, um, Hannah, Leila, who is no longer. Um,